Welcome back to Haunted and Historic Australia and our Criminals, Cutthroats and Convicts series to part two of Lenny McPherson's story in the A-Team. At the end of part one, Lenny had come home one evening in 1960 and attacked his wife Dawn, who had been married to for over 20 years. Over that evening's dinner, not being ready when he wanted it to. Dawn beaten and shook up, calls her father, who arrives at their 22 Prince Edward Street, Gladesville address. The same address that Linny's lived at from just after World War II, up until being sentenced to jail for the last time in the early 90s, later in the story. Dawn's father rescues Dawn, and it must be said, Dawn and Lenny's very young daughter Janelle, just two years old at the time, he takes them back home with him. Sadly, there was a young child, hopefully too young to remember this awful time. As mentioned in closing episode one, Dawn was persuaded not to pursue any criminal charges against her deranged husband Lenny. And so we will begin episode two with the outcome of this situation and how Lenny got away without being charged with attempted murder, which is what Dawn's father had been encouraging her to go for, and rightly so. The outcome was a cunning plan. Lenny was able to put in place one which saw Sergeant Kelly, who it should also be mentioned, that by 1960, when Dawn was leaving Lenny, he and Ray Kelly had built up an effective relationship, which was beneficial to them, both in every way. They'd become very good friends by this time, which is clear evidence that Lenny's side hustle as a police informant, at least with Ray Kelly, but there were others over the time he'd talked to as well, had been established for some time, it can be said that their relationship can go back as far as 1951 and there's a reason it probably did more later. But it is said that Ray Kelly or Gunner Kelly was the one to persuade Dawn not to go after him for attempted murder and to sign over half of their home. It is said that Dawn was paid a large sum of money to walk away from it as too was Kelly paid handsomely for his role in getting Lenny out of trouble again. Kelly wouldn't have wanted his informant to be put in jail for at least 10 years right now. Detective Sergeant Ray Gunner Kelly, Lenny's number one man Cindy's most revered and best detective. Also, Lenny's main contact to provide information on other crimes to help him either better his earning capacity or simply dodge his own current legal troubles in exchange for another prized arrest and show of the skill of New South Wales' finest at the time. Yes, Ray Gunner Kelly was also more accurately known as Ray Verbal Kelly due to his ability to falsify signed statements made by crims he arrested. If the finished product didn't exactly suit old Verbal and he believed that the facts needed to be adjusted to align with the way he wanted to see things and the way he wanted others to see things. To have Lenny charged with attempted murder would cruel all that at this time. That wasn't going to happen. Not if Ray Gunner Kelly could put a stop to it. Now we know that Lenny had friends in high places, but his main man, Stan, needed help and he wasn't going to turn away from it, not even on his wedding night. Yes, at the end of part one, he meets Marlene. Marlene Carol Gilligan and is married to her the very next month. So whether he knew her while he was married to Dawn, or perhaps he was able to just persuade her to marry him 
after only knowing him for a short amount of time. But nevertheless, he organised to be married. Having the wedding ceremony completed at a registrar's office, they did have quite the reception. On this night, during the reception party, things were going nicely. Everyone had plenty to drink, plenty to eat. Lenny knew how, and by this time, had the money to pay for a real nice little spread. The new bride Marlene couldn't have been happier, tying the knot with such an important man like Lenny. Back in 63, when they were married, she wasn't 100% sure exactly what it was that Lenny did for a living. Sure, there was the manager's position down at the motel in Balmain and all, but he had to be into something else, surely. For now, and seemingly for the duration of their married life together, she wasn't about to ask too many questions. He was a man that demanded respect in her eyes and those around him, and she loved her big teddy bear, so that's all that mattered. A far cry from the life Dawn had with Lenny. If you could call that a life. Before we delve further into the life of Lenny McPherson, it is important to put into perspective the fact that not only was he in one shape or the other a lifelong police informant, having close relationships to, in particular, two of the New South Wales Police's most highly regarded yet corrupt detectives in Ray Kelly and Fred Cray. He was also suspected, and usually not by police for the reasons just mentioned, in several murders before his most brazen one, which was planned well before, whilst he was at his own wedding reception, with now close confidant and fellow Balmain boy Stan the Man Smith. The two basically stepped out whilst the party was in full swing to drive up to Allison Road, Randwick in a stolen car they'd already had stashed away nearby. To shoot and kill up-and-coming tough and potential killer Robert Pretty Boy Walker, which the two did within record time and were back at the reception slipping straight into a drink and whatever conversation was being made at the head of the table. And no one was the wiser that these two had just drive-by style killed Pretty Boy with nothing less than a World War II era submachine gun, which was unheard of in 1963 in Sydney, which was in fact never solved. And Lenny and Stan having such an ironclad alibi because 30-odd friends and family were with them the whole night. It is important to mention a story about Lenny's involvement with Detective Ray Kelly. This is the same policeman that worked overtime to arrest Chow Hayes for the murder of Bobby Lee over the mistaken identity murder of Chow's nephew, Danny Simmons, who was shot through the window by assassins at Chow's place on Thomas Street Ultimo back in 1951. In arresting Chow, Kelly couldn't have seemed like more than an honest cop. But the fact is, Chow wasn't a dog, an informant. And to Kelly, he was no use, because men of Chow's era never gave up others to coppers. They rather do the time than be called such things. But Lenny, on the other hand, he was the next generation. He could never take on a bloke like Chow head on. He didn't have the heart to. So he knew that the only way to get blokes like that out of the way was to inform on them, or at least muddy the waters. In fact, Lenny was actually said to have been one of the shooters that were present that evening when they came to kill Chow, but instead got the young upcoming boxer and ladies' man, his nephew Danny, instead, shooting him, thinking it was Chow laying there in the front room. If you haven't already seen Chow's story that we had early last year, definitely go back and check that out. He was our original gangster. Kelly had a bad habit of falsifying sworn statements made to him by criminals, and it's pretty obvious that those he did verbal to suit better his means to closing a case on someone innocent 
were those crooks who held the idea of being an informant as low as being a rapist, something that particular breed of early 20th century gangster in Sydney at least wouldn't dream of being a party to. After Robert Pretty Boy Walker's murder, police were baffled, well, all except Ray Kelly. They knew that it had been two men riding in a stolen car carrying false number plates, driving past Walker at a slow speed, and one fired a burst of 11 shots from an Owen submachine gun, six of which struck Walker in the chest and abdomen. The car sped off and was later found abandoned a mile away. The Sun Herald's police roundsman reported that this was the first time in Australia that a submachine gun had been used for an execution in this Chicago manner. Yes, Lenny McPherson idolised the Mafia, and in particular the Chicago Mafia. So it was fitting that he would kill people in their form. But despite months of investigations by teams of police led by Detective Sergeant Ray Kelly, the Walker murder was never solved. Ray Kelly had to point the police in other directions. One was Raymond Patrick Ducky O'Connor, 25. In February 1964, questioning him over the murder and raiding his home, when picked up, it was alleged that he'd said, Who put me in? I'll bet that bloody McPherson and Stan Smith gave you the drum about me. So it seems the criminals all know that Lenny's an informant. I wonder why nothing ever happened about that. But they knew it, or at least suspected that Lenny was informing on them. Enough to tell the cops so anyway. Although there were no charges in connection to the Walker murder, they did charge one of the witnesses in the inquest, Anthony J. Williams, with perjury. I would have come to the police sooner, only Stan and Lenny and them might have heard about it and they might have done me over. Stan Smith, Lenny McPherson, Ray O'Connor and them. If you don't believe me, you don't know them blokes. They would shoot you as soon as look at you. So it seems that even though the Crims knew he was an informant, none of them seemed to want to go up against him anyway. It was said at this time, it was as if Lenny was given a license to kill. There was already the downfall of George Hackett and an attempted murder on John Joseph Unwin, who had tried to get out of paying Lenny for protection money. A sort of car chase gone wrong. Shooting in public charges were laid on all involved. Lenny and his close friend and accomplice, Snowy Rayner, and Unwin, the rabbit on the run. Another man was in Lenny's firing line, a Charlie Burke. Another standover who had previously respected Lenny's territory. Well, up until now anyway. Charles was hit entering his home in February 1964, almost 60 years ago to be exact. Not only did they shoot him from the bushes in the early hours of the morning, the shooter got up close and personal and hit him point blank another 10 times. Nasty stuff. Another said unsolved case that smells of Lenny McPherson. Lenny was now Mr. Big, but the top spot wasn't without its challenges. And licensed to kill Lenny, made light work of them. Lenny was also mentioned in conjunction with the murder in mid-January 1967 of Big Barry Flock. He was 28 and was shot dead in Paddington, lured there by his mate. Stuart John the Magician Reagan, another standover man. It is believed that after he was shot, one of the men, a partner in a dress shop with Reagan, mentioned to an employee who worked with Big Barry, 
had said that they'd have to find the weapon if they were going to get to them first, and that was at Lenny McPherson's place. She went on to tell this to police, but due to lack of information and witnesses, nothing was done about it. He may not be the man pulling the trigger, but you can bet that he's behind it in some way or another. Next up to the pitch was 50-year-old Robert Lawrence Jackie Steele, a murderer, safe cracker, explosives expert and standover. He was calling himself King of the Crims. On the 26th of November 1965, this king fell in a spray of bullets, but he didn't die straight away. He was able to get home a couple of blocks away, enough time to get help at hospital, at least for a month, and tell police exactly who would hit him. But the police had put it down to retaliation after Jackie Steele had big noted himself in their mind. And after Ray Kelly's help, the case was put to bed. And Jackie eventually died a month later from the injuries of some 40 bullets that had entered his body. Lenny also visited the home of a journalist who listed the top criminals in Sydney. The leading top spot was left blank, and Lenny was marked as number two. He also went on to say some not-so-nice things about Lenny being a fizz gig or informant. Well, Lenny had to pay this fellow a visit. He didn't hurt him, but the intimidation was very clear. Lenny also had a hand in hanging the last man, Ronald Ryan, in 1967. Ronald and mate Peter Walker escaped from Melbourne jail on 19th of December 1965. During the escape, it was said they killed a warden and a tow truck driver and drove a car to Sydney to seek Lenny out for help, having heard how powerful he was. Although they must have missed that paper that the journalist put out, calling Lenny a fizz gig, because Lenny helped them all right. He helped Walker get 12 years for manslaughter and helped Ron Ryan swing on the 3rd of February 1967. The last man hanged in Australia. We will no doubt do a thorough story on this particular man, as this particular story was quite a large one for the time. It almost divided a country some believe that the warden, Hodson, was never shot by Ryan at all. But Victorian Premier Bolt wanted a hanging regardless. Shortly after this incident, Ray Kelly retired, right after being placed on the pedestal for orchestrating the bring down of Ryan and Walker. But this too with it started the decline of Mr Big. We have to stop the video there because it is just going to keep going. There's so much more to tell in Lenny McPherson's story. So stay tuned for part three. And if you're enjoying this journey, definitely give the video a like, subscribe if you haven't already, and stay tuned for part three of Lenny McPherson's involvement within the A-Team.